Didn't know you were unhappy, miserable, unfulfilled, but now that you're gone, I know you had to go. I didn't know you were unfaithful, scandalous, I was a fool, can't believe we were in love. I didn't know you were unhappy, miserable, unfulfilled, but now that you're gone, I know you had to go. It's you, it's you who will be missing now. My friends kept telling me, yeah, yeah. And now they laugh at me, girl, because I couldn't see the truth about you. I didn't know you were unhappy. No, no, no. I'm a little bit now that you're gone. I know you had to go. I The Bible tells the story of how earth was created and the start of humanity. It says that man was created in the image of God, and then after finding that man was lonely, he took a rib from Adam and created Eve. However, it has been suggested that there is a part of the story that was not told in the Bible. The first woman was Lilith, not Eve. Lilith is said to be the first woman in the world and was created by God at the same time he created Adam. It was said that Lilith was then banished and rejected by God after it was found that she was stronger and more intelligent than Adam. She would not obey the commands of Adam. Lilith was said to go against the traditions of the church, that women must obey men and that women were in a lower position than men. Lilith had been a woman who had a character that was firm. She was intelligent and seemed to be superior to Adam. However, Adam was more dominant and had a carnal appetite. In intimacy, Lilith demanded that Adam be on her and she could be on him, but Adam refused. This was said to have caused conflict. It was suggested that Lilith ran straight into the arms of the devil. It was said that all creatures lived in the Garden of Eden and that there were demons. Lilith left Adam and went to Samuel, an archangel who was known as the accuser, seducer, and a destroyer. It was rumored that Lilith bore his offspring, so God cursed her with the generation that appropriated with Samuel. It was rumored that Lilith liked the man's reproductive liquid very much, and all the liquid of a man that does not end in the matrix of his wife is hers. In other words, all the seminal liquid that a man finds wasted throughout his life, whether by adultery, by vice, or in sleep.
Dumpster diving is the practice of forging in garbage that has been put out on the street in dumpsters, garbage cans, etc. for discarded items that may still be valuable, useful, or fixable. In relationships, we are looking for treasure in someone else's trash. All right, you guys, there is a well of extra information, right? So we know that there's a synopsis that's given. There are many things. Uh, there's a synopsis given about Lilith. There's many things that are written. People say that there's missing books. There's missing information. God sculpted Adam, who had a flawless physique and ruggedly handsome features. He was made in God's image. Adam had a godlike personality, perfect, intelligent emotions and will. He possessed a brilliant mind undiminished by sin. He had faultless emotions, including tender and totally unselfish love, the love of God himself. And the Lord fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he bought her to the man. This was God's creative genius, unblemished grace and beauty, pure loveliness of face and form. Her mind, emotions, and will were unaffected by sin. Eve ended Adam's loneliness and filled his life with happiness. Their home was located in Eden, the perfect place. Eden was a luscious green pasture, blanketed with every beautiful and edible growing things. Side by side, they lived and labored in perfect harmony, sharing a sense of mutual interdependence, enjoying a freedom of communion and communication. They were inseparable. Adam and Eve had the favor of God on their life when they were placed in that garden with their assignments. What happened is the voice of the enemy came in and changed their mindset. How quickly can your mindset be shifted? How quickly can an outside influence change what you believe about your relationship? How quickly can someone else's opinion about your relationship cause you to be derailed or take you off into some far land that you were never meant to go? Satan used the tree of knowledge of good and evil to do his sinister work. Instead of fleeing from temptation, Eve flirted with it. She had everything a person could want in life, but she stood there and allowed her mind to meditate on the one thing she did not have until it became an obsession with her and brought her happy honeymoon to an unhappy termination. Guys, imagine this. Standing in the garden where she is assigned to be, in this beautiful place that God put her, gave her everything that she needs, and she allows the enemy to come in and talk to her. How many times has God given you something? How many times has that perfect relationship entered in and you allowed a toxic person, somebody that you have a toxic relationship with, to enter in? Let's talk about it, exes. Ooh, let's talk about ex-boyfriends or ex-girlfriends. Let's talk about ex-husbands or ex-wives. I was like, okay, that'd be fine, you know, because um, he was always up under me and, you know, we were trying to get adjusted to each other and everything. And um, I went ahead and I let him, I was like, you know, go ahead. I didn't want him to think I was this wife that he couldn't do anything or go any, anywhere. I just wanted him to feel like, you know, he had a little bit of freedom and that I trusted him. However, I trusted him too much because later on, um, I guess a woman has this intuition when she knows her, when her husband or her boyfriend or her significant other is doing something that he shouldn't be doing and you start trying to investigate things and most of the time you find things and I started finding numbers of different women and um, it was just a lot of cheating and a lot of lying. Early in the marriage we were not having sex and I didn't understand why. So I confronted him one day and he said he had been to the doctor and found out he had gonorrhea. So I said, well, he said, you need to go to the doctor and be checked. And I said, well, how do you know that you didn't get it from me? He says, I know I didn't get it from you. It's a reoccurrence of a previous infection. So that sounded suspicious to me. So I went to the doctor and was tested and it came back negative. And so I asked the doctor, was it possible to get a case of gonorrhea from a previous infection? He said, it's not likely depending on how long ago he had it and if he had 
taken all the medication for it. So I didn't go into details with him. I just accepted what the doctor said, and, I, and I, then I realized that he had not um, gotten it from a reoccurrence, that he had been creeping. And when he placed them there, he gave both of them assignments. We all know from scripture, from learning that Adam was placed first and Eve was taken from him. And he called her woman because she was a part of him that had a womb, basically, right? But they were placed there and they each were given roles and each given assignments. And because God gave them their assignments, there was no question about what they were supposed to do. What has happened to us today? Why do we find such an issue or why do we take such an issue with having an assignment in a relationship? Why do we take exception to what God has said a man should be and a woman should be? Why do we take exception to what the word has written, but yet we call ourselves Christians and we call ourselves those that are full of faith? The reality is, is that Adam had an assignment. God gave it to him. Eve had an assignment and she was called the help me, help suited to meet his needs. What does that mean to us today? It's written, the scripture tells us exactly what we should do. And the thing that we must understand when we're talking about the healing process and we're talking about toxic relationships and how do we eliminate it in the kingdom? How do we eliminate it in society? We have to take responsibility, which was one of the things that we found in scripture that no one was willing to do. Sin is accompanied by disastrous consequences, whether or not we're willing to accept the blame for it. Adam blamed his part of the tragedy on Eve and God. The consequences were almost more than Adam and Eve could bear. For Eve, the pain of childbirth would be a reoccurring reminder of sin. In addition to that, she would experience an insatiable yearning for a husband, a piercing desire for his time, his attention, his affection, and his assurance. Her need would be great. Her sinful husband would seldom be willing to meet it. Adam and Eve, much like many people, found themselves in a predicament, in a position where their relationship started out. It was everything that God intended. It was just as it should be written. And then all of a sudden something enters in. We understand that from scripture and from reading scripture, from learning, that it was sin itself that entered into the earth. What do you think sin brought with it? It brought with it toxicity. It brought with it negativity. It brought with it blame. It brought with it shame. It brought with it pointing of the fingers. It brought with the accusatory accusations. And it brought with it all of the negative things that we see and that we have the, that we develop in relationships. Why? Because it's in our DNA. It comes from the beginning. It comes from what was written. And we have to understand as individuals that just like Adam and Eve, we start out wonderful we start out good but something enters in something comes from the outside something starts from somewhere else and just like a cancer if we don't stop it it spreads and we find ourselves dealing with toxic relationships toxic relationships is any relationship that is unfavorable to you or yours the foundations of any relationship healthy or not are most commonly established upon mutual admiration and respect but can in time become remarkably unhealthy like my parents were in a toxic relationship i mean i was young during that time man i don't i don't know like i don't recall you know what i do remember is like yeah i live in a two-parent household but it's not like I know if it was any harm done in between the two, I don't know. Like, I really, I can't sit here and answer that question. But growing up, looking back on it, like, after everybody was dispersed, gone, you know, divorced or whatever, like, I seen some things, and if you say that's toxic, then, yeah, that was, that was toxic for me to see. Because even when I think about, like, love now, like, I didn't, grow up, you know, with, you know, my mom being in a relationship, you know, seeing my dad, you know, you know, been married um, two times. Like, all I know is a man being, not saying being with multiple women, but it's like, it's not always with the one you would say you would want to be with, put it like that. So, I mean... If that's all you know and that's all you see, you know, yeah, you know, you gonna transition and do the same things you seen your people do. You see what I'm saying? 
the some of the just, just the back and forth like yeah you know your mom putting words in your mouth and your dad putting words in your mouth it's just yeah i wouldn't say you put a child through that that shit was whack um man i can say how i felt when that certain person cheated on me man and you know and i and i thought about all the things that i've done wrong that i had done wrong that wasn't right but when i actually found out that she had cheated on me you know it felt like a dagger to my heart man you know uh actually actually at the time when i found out i was i was incarcerated and i went to the phone uh, I, I made a phone call because i had been hearing some things and um when i called you know she confirmed it you know she asked just that she didn't want to talk to me no more um to leave her alone and she wasn't returning none of my letters how really i felt like things was uh not right then but it just felt like a dagger in my heart man you know just felt like you know uh how could she do that to me toxic relationships when the relationship between two people is toxic and dangerous they are slowly destroying each other but they don't even see it they are unhealthy for each other blinded by their romance a kind of abusive relationship. A toxic relationship is poisonous to the individuals emotionally and spiritually. I would have to say the verbal abuse was getting more direct. Before it was more indirect. You can imagine going to places and the person you're with compliment how beautiful another woman is. Or you'd watch a movie and they would compliment you know, how they look or they would compare you to previous relationships. So it was like, oh, okay. And of course I was nothing like anybody I could tell he ever dated from knowing his baby mama's foot. So I apologize if that's the wrong terminology, but that's all I know. Um, I was nothing like the ones he knew as baby mamas. I was way different. I knew nothing about street life, thug life. None of that made any sense to me. None at all. So to me, it was the verbal abuse became more direct. The name calling, the, the, uh, the silent treatment. Or as I advanced in my career, I knew I could never tell him that I got a promotion or I got an escalation. I could never do that. It was immediate shutdown, immediate. So I knew at that moment, I said, okay, this is not gonna work out well. And it reminded me of a conversation my dad and my granddad would have with me when I was little. They would say, Teresa, unless you marry a man that make more money than you or the same as you, it's going to be a problem. I'm fresh out of the military and uh, I decided to go to barber school. And while I'm going to barber school, I was feeling kind of arrogant. So I was trying to be a player, be a player in the school. And then one day I met this one lady. And I thought she was the baddest thing in the school. So I started dating. She played hard to get. And once we got serious and I decided to make it 100 with her, it seemed like she started falling back towards me. And then uh, one day she ended up pregnant and uh, she ended up having twins. And as soon as the first baby was born, I held a little boy and I could already knew right then the baby wasn't mine. So then she had to have a cesarean and had a second child. And I was there for that. And they asked me if I wanted to sign a birth certificate and I wouldn't do it. So for eight months, these twins, she had put my last name on those twins. So I went through a lot of uh, judicial trouble behind this girl. I almost got kicked out of barber school behind this girl. So finally, I just gave it all up and I called my mother and me and her, we prayed and we asked God, forgive me for everything I did, because every girl I played, that one thing she did to me went through my mind. So uh, I ended up getting a blood test done on the low low. Once I got that blood test done, I called her up. Once I got the results, and I told her she heard the kids had to get out of my apartment. And when I got home that evening, only thing I had in there was a toothpick. Everything go. His behavior was different coming home late. The money issues were different. Um, money was always given for bills, but then there was a need for money throughout the week. Um, coming up short at things that we had made plans for. Um, 
and then it took me a while to really realize what was going on. Things were missing around the house, and I finally came to the conclusion that um, my husband um, was an addict. My husband had a drug problem. At the time, I really didn't know exactly what he was doing. At first, I thought maybe he's gambling um, or, you know, I didn't know much, to be honest, I didn't know much about drug usage and, um, you know, in my mind, all I knew was what a crackhead looked like on TV. Signs you're in a toxic relationship, number one. It seems like you can't do anything right. Number two, everything is about them and never about you. Number three, you find yourself unable to enjoy good moments with this person. Number four, you're uncomfortable being yourself around the person. Number five, you're not allowed to grow and change. I didn't realize that my relationship was toxic until it was over. My fiance, father of my children, boyfriend of 16 years, spent a lot of time convincing me of who I wasn't. I didn't realize it until one of the biggest events of my life, my promotion, my first job going into social work. Um, my job gave me this big promotional party. I asked him to come. He came, but he wasn't happy. And me being who I am, always being the people pleaser, I convinced everybody that he was okay. Little did I know later on that he really wasn't okay. He took me out for a celebratory dinner. And at this dinner, he told me, he grabbed my hand and he told me, he said, you're the woman that I love, the woman I want to spend the rest of my life with, but it's 10 things I need to tell you. It's a few things you need to change about yourself if you want to continue to be with me. He said, these are the 10 things I hate about you. And he started at number one. He said, number one, he said, you're not submissive enough. By this time, I'm in shock. My heart is broken. I'm just stunned. He went on to number two, number three, number four. By this time, I had completely spazzed out. I went somewhere else mentally. I was crushed, but he went on to tell me if I made these changes, that I would be the perfect woman for him. This Negro gonna tell me, baby, I done put you on and when I got with you, you didn't have shit. You, I bought you these cars. I put you in this house. A double wide trailer? That's what you put me in? And wouldn't allow me to buy the curtains? You got, we got foil on the window? And you talking about, well, that's how we do it in Louisiana. We just put foil on the window. So that's what you got me on? Toxic masculinity. It refers to the socially constructed attitudes that describe the masculine gender role as violent, unemotional, and sexually aggressive. When I was a little girl, I want to say I was about maybe between the ages of six and eight. And I was at a family member's house. And um, I went into the back room. And in that back room, was a family member and while I was in the room he pulled out his private part and he showed it to me and he wanted me to fill it and I, I felt it and then he wanted me to get on the bed he never penetrated me or anything in that manner but he did go down on me and I want to say this happened about, it happened twice. So for example, uh, in premarital counseling, I might have uh, John and uh, Sue. And so when they come in, nothing's wrong. They're happy, they're in love, uh, they're ready to get married, and there's some toxic things that have not been discovered. So as we have talked and we've done a clinical assessment, I've assessed that maybe Sue um, was, was raped. Um, and so 
with her being raped, she never thought that she needed to tell her fiance that she was raped. And so that is significant. Why? Because being raped can cause some toxic behavior. Not saying it will, but it can. These are the things that we definitely need to know from the onset of premarital. Now, John, John grew up in a home where it was domestic violence. So domestic violence, he witnessed it. So when he witnessed his dad hitting his mom, that is his instructions potentially of how to be a husband, as well as it can be how to be a father too. So with that level of violence, a lot of research will tell you is that if I grew up in this type of household, it's a big chance that I might be a perpetrator. Toxic masculinity is used in psychology to refer to certain norms of masculine behavior that are associated with harm to society and to men themselves. How she should be careful how, about how she treat men. Uh, I told her to never get physical or hit a man because chances are the man will retaliate and hit her. Traditional stereotypes of men as socially dominant, along with related traits such as misogyny and homophobia, can be considered toxic due to the promotion of violence, including sexual assault and domestic violence. For example, bullying. I had my daughter at the age of 16, and that was when our relationship really started to change. I noticed that he became more and more distant and I started seeing him less and less. And when I did see him, we seemed to be fighting more. And I got scared because I didn't know what I was going to do at 16 with a baby. So when he came home and I asked him where he'd been, he was, I don't know if he had been drinking or what, but he got really upset with me and he drugged me out of bed. And threw me to the floor and he hit me. And my baby was in the next room asleep. Men who adhere to traditional masculine cultural norms, such as risk-taking, violence, dominance, primacy to win, and pursuit of social status tend to be more likely to experience psychological problems, such as depression, stress, body image problems, substance abuse, and poor social functioning. I'm asleep and I'm being awakened to being thrown across the room like literally just snatched out of the bed and thrown across the room. And he's on top of me hitting me. And I'm like, what in the, so at that moment, my fight or flight adrenaline kicks in. So I'm fighting back, not even knowing what, I am literally having a knockdown drag out fight in my own bedroom. And I don't even know why. The effects tend to be stronger in men who have emphasized toxic masculine norms, such as self-reliance, seeking power over women, and sexual promiscuity, or playboy behavior, and the role of trophy hunting sexual behaviors. I've had multiple women at a time. I probably slept with five, six different women a day. Every day, you know, I still wanted to be in the streets. I still wanted to do Michael Earl and do my thing. So I had uh, different women that, you know, that I would, that I would see, you know, women that I would have sex with. You know, I wasn't ready for a committed relationship. And as a bachelor, you know, I had, I dated multiple women simultaneously. And I just was not committed, ready to commit to a relationship. That was something that I learned to take advantage of once I became pretty good in basketball in high school. And uh, it wasn't that we was trying to be players, but once you find out that you had a personality where you could, you know, sway someone or be nice to them, and then if you could ever take it to the next level, you would. But the thing about Duplin County, where I grew up from, Everybody, there wasn't but a few players, and those few players either had beef with each other, 
and everybody was messing with the same person type deal. Then it started becoming like a competition thing, who could, who could get the most phone numbers or who could meet the most women. And as you start doing that at an early age, like any drug, you can get addictive. The reason a lot of men cheat is because a lot of times the man's woman will not perform certain acts, or sexual acts, in the bedroom. Some women don't want you pulling her hair. Some women don't want you spanking her. Uh, some women don't want to uh, involve other women or uh, use certain uh, toys. So if a, if a man's not getting that at home and he finds a woman that's willing to do it, then chances are greater that he will cheat. Cain and Abel were the first two sons of Adam and Eve. Cain, the firstborn, was a farmer and his brother Abel was a shepherd. And the preparation of this story is the offering. And Cain has asked for an offering, so he gives some vegetation, he gives some yield. But Abel makes the righteous decision to give the fatty part of the calf. He's given God the best that he has. So therefore, the story teaches us that God favors Abel's offering. The brothers made sacrifices to God, each offered his produce, but God favored Abel's sacrifice instead of Cain's. So Cain is angry, Cain is jealous, Cain is, is rocking, like we said earlier, like Guru from Gangstar, uh, uh, your moment of truth is coming and the shame shiesty cats that you hang with and do your thing with will set you up and wet you up. Near peep the language, it's universal. So Cain and Abel go out into the field. Cain then murdered Abel. When Cain realized what he had done, he was more concerned that someone might have seen what he had done than feeling sorry for his brother's death. God punished Cain by condemning him to a life of wandering. Cain was rumored to be the originator of evil, violence, and greed. Cain was the first human born. Abel was the first to die. Toxic families are families where there is mental, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. In toxic families, there are different situations, each with its own considerations. Toxic family dynamics can be hard to recognize. Any behavior or scenario that makes you feel unloved, unwanted, or even just bad about yourself is most likely not a healthy one. All families struggle, but members still feel loved, supported, and respected. My toxic relationship is with my brother. Uh, it's been going on probably for <laughs> since birth. Uh, you don't know someone don't like you until I guess you get older. The time I was around my brother, I just felt like I was not good enough. So my relationship with my father, who is now deceased, he actually passed in 2016. It was always a toxic relationship. Um, I was his third child, um, but my sister and I had the same mother. I was raised with my sister and he had three other children out of wedlock. Um, he and my mother divorced when I was very young, I was under 10. And I remember going from um, a home with a white picket fence to a one bedroom apartment because of my mother leaving my father. She found out he had had another child um, that was less than a year older than me. And my son, my son on the other hand, you know, he was always just the good guy, this popular guy, you know, never had a whole lot of girlfriends. One night, I'm in the bed and all of a sudden we get a phone call. My son calls me and says, uh, Dad, I need for you to come up here. I said, why, what happened? He said, the girl's father and mother came up there, came to the school, asked them to go for a ride with well, them. They do. They get him in a, somewhere in Durham, he didn't know where he was at. Father pulls out a gun on him, makes him get out of the car, puts the gun to his head, telling him, you know, you ain't this, you ain't that, you know, you're not gonna do my daughter, you know, you're not gonna have my daughter, all this kind of stuff, so. 
left him there. Left him in the middle of the dorm to walk to get back to get back to campus the best way he could. She was married once previous to me, had a child with him. She was married again to a different gentleman, had a child with him. So here I come in to a ready-made family. I adopted her youngest. Within a year of the adoption, within a year of the adoption, she wanted a divorce. You know, we make decisions that affect us, but we really don't look at who they're really affecting. So this toxic marriage has manifested into a toxic father and daughter relationship. Signs that you grew up in a toxic family. Number one, you neglect your own emotional needs. Number two, you are terrified of manipulation. Number three, you have difficulty trusting others. Number four, you second guess your relationships with your family. Number five, you lack a strong sense of identity. Number six, you feel perpetually infantilized. Toxic love is typically associated with strong highs where both parties feel jubilant and passionate and the lowest of lows often resulting in depression and generally feeling stressed for long periods of time. What are you, what are you doing? Come on, you going through my phone again? Yes, who is Sharon? Sharon who? Text message. Ain't nobody texting me. You keep going through. Where do we keep going through this? You keep doing the same thing. I'm not trying to. That's go. the second time you've done listen, this. Listen, 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 listen. Hey, baby. Listen. Baby, who you talking about, baby? I ain't saying no. That's baby. what the only text, baby I have is you. That's what the text message said. Nah, you you who, reading it wrong. You reading it wrong. Who is Sharon? Is nobody such thing as Sharon, baby? Yes, it it's is. Me. You're lying. Why you lying? lying? For? Because I just saw the text message. You ain't see shit. I did. You I said, see. you going to sit right here in my face and lie. I'm not sitting in nobody's face and lie. For one, it's nobody named Sharon, and you're going to do my phone again. There's no reason for that. I'm going to ask you one more time. Who ask is Sharon? Me what? Who is Sharon? A list of signs of toxic love. Number one, chronically second-guessing yourself and doubting when you're upset with your partner. Number two, making excuses to friends and family members about your partner's poor behaviors. Number three, taking yourself away from your own feelings. Number four, anger that never seems to get resolved when you communicate with your partner. Number five, constantly trying to fix things in the relationship, working overtime to please or make things right, feeling guilty and working to make amends about things that really may not be your responsibility. We then began to speak to one another um, uh, with ill uh, feelings and with uh, regard that was very careless and reckless. Uh, we began to curse at one another. We began to uh, call each other names and we began to devalue each other. Um, this eventually led to uh, this particular young lady uh, having a, a, an additional relationship, unbeknownst to me, with one of my pers uh, personal close friends. I opened that damn phone up and I held that phone to my ear and I didn't say shit. I heard another voice on the other line say, baby. And then I said, who the fuck is this? And she immediately hung that damn phone up. I, of course, tried to call her ass back. I said, you know what? I'm dialing that damn phone like hell to call her back. And, of course, y'all know she was scared. She ain't answer. But that was everything laid out on the damn phone. Damn sex messages, text messages, all this shit. Meet me at room 102. It got to a point where I refused to talk to her because a lot of profane language, uh, name calling, and this is not how I was brought up. I, didn't, I was not brought up in this type of environment. I never seen my mom and dad argue. I never seen my dad or my mom curse at one another. I never seen my mom and dad raise their voice at one another. So being in this toxic relationship where I'm calling out my name, I'm being referred to as a nigga, uh, constantly cursing, it put me in a place where 
for the first time in my life, I want to put my hands on her. So when talking about toxic and unhealthy relationships, I always try to deliver a message that says love does not leave bruises. But even in that, you have to think that there are always two parties. There is the participant and then there is the perpetrator, right? And so when you talk about love does not leave bruises, you have to understand that a bruise is an indication that something has gone wrong. It is an indication that some type of trauma has occurred. David was one of the remarkable men of the Old Testament. He was a capable musician and beloved poet. He excelled as a military leader and king and a man after God's own heart. He was an exceptional religious leader. Yet, in spite of his illustrious achievements, Israel's greatest king was not without some grievous faults, not the least of which was his shameful conduct with Bathsheba. And the Bible even tells you that David grew up to be handsome. It says he was breathtakingly handsome. So when he was young, nobody identified that. But now he's the man. Now he's the king. David, who remained in Jerusalem, arose one evening from his bed and saw from the rooftop of his palace the beautiful Bathsheba, wife of Uriah, the Hittite, bathing. Inflamed with passion, the king sent for the immodest temperist and with her committed adultery. His father, right? was messed up. That is his most important relationship. That's where he gets his identity. That's where he learns how to be a man. That's where he learns, you know what I mean, how this man thing is supposed to happen. When David was informed of Bathsheba's pregnancy, he was determined to conceal the sin. David summoned Uriah from the battlefield under the presumption that, while on furlough, Uriah would visit his wife and thus, when Bathsheba's child was born, it would appear to be the offspring of Uriah. Uriah, however, being the patriotic warrior that he was, refused to indulge in the matrimonial pleasure. So as long as his comrades in arm were in battle, Frustrated, David then sought to intoxicate the soldier to break down his resistance, that he might go down to his wife and so cover the illegitimate conception. And it's easy to blame it on Bathsheba. That's what we do. We blame the victim. But he was the king. Women are drawn to money, power, and prestige. Was she really going to say no? David did everything he had to do to clean it up. In true desperate measure, King David sent Uriah back to the battlefront. King David ordered the troops to withdraw from him that he might be slain. Thus did the courageous warrior die, never knowing his wife's infidelity with the king of Israel. When Bathsheba heard of Uriah's death, she went through a period of grief. Afterward, she became King David's wife and had his son. But the problem was there was a glitch in the system. Something was missing in its foundation. It's just like building a house. You cannot build a house on a cracked foundation. If you attempt to build that structure on a foundation that's cracked, it will not properly sustain the weight of whatever it is that you pour on top of it. So that's why David was running after all these women. He had all these wives. That's why David had this issue with Bathsheba. I see you, dark soul, unrelenting destroyer, cold heart, reckless in your betrayal. No thought of who or how you hurt, thoughtless discard, careless abandon, dark soul, cold heart, devoid of feeling, ruthless in your deceit, no longer in disguise. I see you. Narcissistic personality disorder, one of several types of personality disorders, is a mental condition in which people have an inflated sense of their own importance, a deep need of excessive attention and admiration, troubled relationships, and a lack of empathy for others. So one of the hardest uh, diagnoses to deal with as it relates to toxic behaviors is a narcissistic personality disorder. Um, 
typically when, you know, I have a couple that comes in um, and I assess that that person is narcissistic, um, the way they typically get you is the charisma, the charm, um, you know, being grandiose, you know, things are, they're just pretty much always on top of the world. Um, and they make you feel good. And so if they make you feel good, um, you just kind of just get, you know, sucked into that, that person's world. Narcissists are some of the most, I think, dangerous and harmful people out there because they leave this trail of brokenness and damage behind for other people to clean up. 11 signs you are dating a narcissist. Number one, they are charming as fuck at first. Number two, they hog the conversation talking about how great they are. And they like to make everything revolve around them, even if the topic is not about them. Number three, they feed off your compliments. Number four, they lack empathy. Number five, they don't have any or many long-term friends. Number six, they pick on you constantly. Number seven, they gaslight you. The gaslighting is when they make you think that you are the crazy one. Number eight, they dance around defining the relationship. Number nine, they think they're right about everything and never apologize. Number 10, they panic when you try to break up with them. Hey, why aren't we together? And she tells me, we've been broke up. Can you imagine being in a relationship where you think you're in a relationship, but the other person has already moved on from you? You know, I found myself begging, stay with me. Number 11, and when you show them you're really done, they lash out. A toxic relationship is a relationship characterized by behaviors on the part of the toxic partner that is emotionally and not infrequently physically damaging to their partner. Because the sex was horrible. It was horrible. He had a nice package, don't get me wrong. And it's pretty, but his sexual skills were horrible. And in the 20 years, I can't think of a time where, wow, that was good. It made you tired. It definitely made you tired. But was it fulfilling? No. Was it satisfying? No. You sort of just going through the motion. It was almost like it was emotionless. Uh, uh, passion, intermittent. It wasn't, it wasn't consistent. So for him to withhold sex was like, good, I get a break. But at the same time, you knew, okay, who is it now? So you're either hot or you're cold. Um, it can be painful, very painful. At times, it can be completely different, perverted. You're like, I say, who? I say, all right, who, who is this now? Also, you will start noticing the smell is different. The feel is different. Whenever there's another woman, you could tell. A toxic relationship is characterized by insecurity, dominance, and control. Introducing the toxic specimen. Number one, the narcissist makes everything about them, manipulates you to serve their needs. Extremely charming and intoxicating. I'm the toxic one. I, uh, I date women or I've dated women that I've known they can't have children. And that is my biggest thing. I've broken up with good women. I know they were wifey material. I know I should have married them. It's all about self. They will make you feel like they are the best thing that ever happened to you. And your job is to elevate them and make them feel good. The manipulator, they spend most of their time trying to sway your opinion to agree with them. They will always constantly tell you that they have a better way of doing things, their idea is better than yours, and you should try their idea first. 
Number two, the heart collector. Considers having multiple partners a cool trait. Emotionally unavailable. Lacks empathy. You do things that your head is telling you different from what your heart is telling you. I felt that all my life I've been, for lack of a better phrase, Captain save a Do I do these things that I do? Then I think back to when my dad used to tell me stories. My father used to tell me these stories, different women he used to sleep around with, different women he used to, he used to mess around with, cheerleaders, flag girls, sorority women, all these, all these women. Mess around with all these women, then on campus, my mom came along. Messed around, got my mom pregnant. Then, my mom told my dad, hey, I might be, I'm, I'm pregnant. My dad, my dad cussed my mom out. Called all types of names out of her name. And, and basically say it's not mine. It's not my kid. Number three, the chess player plays a long-term game, asks for support from you. They disappear when you need something, uses people to get what they want. Eventually, like I said, eight years later, I actually remarried this man. And the amazing thing is that, you know, it seems so bizarre. Nobody really could understand it. I had a few friends that could understand, but most people couldn't understand how could you return to this man, this toxic relationship. And so for me, what, what is so interesting is for me, it was actually friend. Um, and we remarried and in less than a year, the marriage ended. After my ex started going to church on a regular basis, he became very involved in the church and the pastor would call on him for this or that. After we got divorced, my pastor just out of the blue one day called me and he says, hey, how are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm good. How are you? Where is this going? I said, are you trying to have a relationship with me or what? He said, he says, he starts backpedaling. He goes, oh, no, no, no. He's like, um, my life is complicated right now. So I said, well, I think it's best that you don't call me again. I was telling my girlfriend this story, who she seems to know a lot about him. And she starts telling me about all these women in the church that he apparently has had a relationship with. And mind you, he has been married and divorced four times. So I feel like if I had not put a stop to it, he would have been another man trying to prey on me like my ex. Number four, the two-faced reaper acts a certain way in front of you, says toxic things about you when you're not around. It's unbelievable how a person can actually be Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde you have no idea when it's coming or how it's coming. It just happens. For me, it started just like any other relationship would start. You think you've met someone decent. You think you've met someone nice. Um, but with a the narcissist, they do a technique called mirroring. What they are doing is they're mirroring you. They are looking at your great qualities and all the characteristics that make you a good person they know that that's important to you, so they mirror that back to you, giving you the impression that you have met your twin flame or soulmate. Number five, the dark friend. 
acts as a caring friend. Trade your loyalty for respect with other people by backstabbing you. Statistic supply is whatever they need from you. It could be a place to stay, it could be money, it could be just someone to give them love or to respect them. But whatever it is that they need, they seek out people who they know they can get that from. Once that supply has been met, that's it. And they do what we call discarding. And you're literally discarded as if you were a piece of trash. Number six, the planter. Cleverly plants dark ideas in your mind and playing mind games. My parents had gotten divorced or had broken up and I wanted my daughter to have her father in her life. So we got married and three months into the marriage, he told me that he had still been seeing this same woman and that she was pregnant by him again. And not long after that, I found that I was pregnant again. And I told him, and he told me, he didn't want to have a baby with me. And if I wanted to have a baby, I had to get out of the marriage. So, I did everything that I could to lose that baby. Everything short of having an abortion. And four months into the pregnancy, I had a miscarriage. He was laying in the bed asleep, and I was laying next to him in pain. And I woke him up and told him I was hurting. He wouldn't even get up. So I crawled out of bed to the bathroom and I had my, I miscarried my baby sitting on the toilet. Dumpster diving. What does your dumpster look like? Are you consistently diving into garbage, constantly fighting with all your might, while trying to hold on to toxic relationships and people that serve no purpose and value in your life? This trash comes with an odor. This stench draws flies and maggots. The maggots eventually will eat away your heart and your soul, and you will rot and decay. What choice will you make today? Full of waste, nasty, disgusting, stinking trash bags must disappear. Allow the healing to break through for you. It's a new rebirth of self-freedom that would allow you to manage your waste. As honest awareness of oneself and acceptance of that truth is the first step toward change. For you can't change what you don't know or don't acknowledge. Getting out if you're stuck in an unhealthy relationship. Number one. Make a commitment. Decide once and for all, you are going to end it. Number two, enlist support from family and friends. Number three, make a clean break. Number four, don't try to be friends. Number five, don't feel you need to rescue your partner. Number six, fill the void. To serve and be served. But in order for that to happen, you must serve yourself first because you cannot impact someone else's life if your life is in shambles. And most of the time it comes from learned behavior or others who have inspired you to make decisions that you now realize are not the ones you're wanting to make. And in life and in a relationship, those things are built on just that. We're wanting to understand ourselves in, other, in order to make a difference for others. So we get in the car, you know, everything good. I'm like, how you doing? Like, everything all right? I could just see in her eyes like she was crying. And I was like, yeah, this not going to go so well. We start the conversation off with, 
I really love you and I wish the best for you, but I don't feel like I can do this anymore. And me, I was feeling the same way, but I don't feel like I was man enough to actually, you know, tell her that because I felt like I was gonna lose my everything. You know, I grew, I grew, I basically grew with this woman to my adulthood, from my childhood, my teenhood. So to hear those words, I'm like, all right, you know, me being, I ain't gonna say a sad puppy, but you know, I'm being like, nah, like we can work this out. What, what is there I can do to make you feel whole again? What can I do to make you feel like I deserve you basically? She was like, it's nothing. It's, it's, it's nothing you can do. It's, it's nothing. Like I'm completely tired emotionally. I'm trained emotionally, like, so I'm like, what you, what you, what you saying to me? Like, you don't love me no more? Like, it ain't, it's no spark no more? Like, what is it? No, William, like, I, I don't love you. Just no communication left between the two of us, and if I don't like you no more, if I don't feel in my heart, in my gut, and in love, it's time for me to go. 10 Steps to End a Toxic Relationship Number one, step out of denial. Think that you got something good and then you find out, shit, you in the dumpster. And not only was I in the dumpster, I lived in the dumpster. Number two, keep a journal of emotions. Number three, identify the perks. Number four, fill the hole. Number five, surround yourself with positive friends. Number six, drop a note to yourself. Number seven, bribe yourself. Number eight, heal the shame. Number nine, repeat affirmations. Number 10, allow some rest. We need to step back, reset, replenish. There is this constant uh, demand on everything of ourselves that we forget that we need to step back, reset, replenish, rejuvenate our spirit. And that's why I like coming out to the forest because all of the natural sounds, I get to unplug from my daily busy lifestyle and get back to who I am at my core. Cognitive dissonance is the psychological theory that describes the discomfort that results from holding two or more opposing beliefs, and you likely experience it when rationalizing. Cognitive dissonance can result when you and your husband or wife have different views, attitudes, or behaviors. Understand the cognitive distortions, if they're irrational thoughts, that means I can't have a rational conversation with the irrational person. There were decades of bad relationships and that led to something that I did that I was a part of that I can never really, I've been trying to live down that for the longest haunted me and affected me. Um, had a relationship with a friend's girlfriend live in. Um, that's the unthinkable. Lost a lot of associates and friends over this. We're cool now, but this is what I'm talking about. In my mind, because I did that, the divorce that I got was a direct reflection of what I did, it was payback in my mind. In abusive relationships, the survivor may justify the abuser's behavior and downplay what happened and how it made them feel to reduce the cognitive dissonance. The survivor in these types of relationships have trouble deciding whether to stay or leave since they may view the violence as an exception that doesn't represent the person's past behaviors. What should I become aware of? That's the number one question that we sometimes just don't focus on. So in that content and understanding, you have to really process it and dissect yourself to know what to do. Seven lessons after leaving toxic relationships. Number one, setting boundaries. 
breaking away from unhealthy, highly critical, or controlling people can help us set more definite boundaries in all our future relationships. You know, when any female, it's like, I always revert back to that old wheel. Like, I can tell myself, like, all right, these are things you can't do, because I know those are things that you did in the past that, you know, caused that. So now it's like, whatever situation I'm in, whoever I'm with, it's like everything can be all good. But it's like dumpster diving, like I'm diving into something, trying to find something, find a need to get just so I can bring it back to the counterpart that I'm with now. Number two, focusing on self-care. So I like to get people to focus on the relationship that they have with their self. And that can be one of the most toxic relationships that we have. Not taking care of ourselves, our self-care, not eating well, not working out. So when we are stressing and putting other people's needs before our own and taking care of everybody, that is creating a toxic lifestyle. Number three, appreciating the good relationships. Number four, practicing compassion. Number five, trust your intuition. Number six, embrace change. Number seven, trust yourself. See, I went through a terrible time in middle school and in high school with people always thinking I was something that I didn't even think I was. Oh, you think you're pretty. Oh, you think you're this. Or, oh, you think you're that. Or I had issues with older gentlemen, older guys looking for uh, sex basically and finding it because I didn't know what love was so there I am giving myself to them not understanding what I'm doing what was I doing you guys diving into a deep deep dark hole pulling all of this negativity into my life looking for understanding looking for love trying to find the truth but I'm telling you it doesn't matter today it, none of it matters once you've sought your healing, once you've done the work, once you've gone through the process, once you've fought for what you know and what you believe, none of it matters because healing is for everybody. Positive lifestyles are for everybody. Health is for everybody. All it takes is a little dedication and some work from you. God has it for you. Go out there and get it. Be bold about it. Find your truth. Live it. Never lie about it. Show it to others because it's through our testimony that others overcome. Dear woman, I apologize how I treated you from the beginning of time, how I manipulated you throughout the years, lying in your ears, causing those forever tears, having sex with you without the love, abandoned the family after the support order from the judge. One woman, two women, three women. This is how I was taught to be a man. Toxic masculinity, false sense of self, saving the same woman from her repeated past, looking for love in the trash. Please forgive me for the original sin. I wish I had the opportunity to do this dumpster diving all over again. Damn, what a fucking nightmare. Didn't know you were unhappy, miserable, unfulfilled, but now that you're gone, I know you had to go. I didn't know you were unfaithful, fabulous, I was a fool, can't believe we were in love. I didn't know you were unhappy, miserable, unfulfilled, but now that you're gone, I know you had to go. I didn't know you were unfaithful, fabulous, I was a fool, can't believe we were in love. Like you, they're wrong. I gave the best to me, so why can't you see? It's you, it's you.
Just fine, I'll be alright. I'll be just fine. Say bye. 